Hey, it's your boy 950 Kev for the 950 Lounge Show with LeBron James in the radio game, the most electrifying man in media today. And I'm one fifth of the best team in radio. So I'm joined by my brother Rodeo, the funny guy, just the classic man, the cynic, aka Mr. Roper Backstage Ed, and the lovely, super talented Steph Pearl. It's 950 Lounge every day, all day on multiple networks. So tell us a listen, let us know what you think. Catch us at www.9feetlounge.com or my Instagram at 950 Kev. We're back on the ride, 950 Lounge in the morning, joined by the, well, part of the best team in radio and some really solid best team performers, just the classic man, 950 Kev, my man Tanny sitting in the room, and uh, obviously uh, the James Earl Jones, Real Mike, the moderator. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We are really uh, honored to have a gentleman here um, who's uh, getting ready. To, he's already done some amazing things in, in, in the 16th district, and now he's looking to extend that. And uh, being a constituent and... Um, I know Justice as well. Yeah. We're so proud to have him on the show this morning. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Go House and his maiden voyage running for the con- con- Congressional 16th District. I'm going to get that out. My man, Jamal Bowman. Welcome to the show, my friend. How are you, man? Thank you, brother. Thanks for having me. Appreciate no doubt. It. We appreciate a few minutes. Um, Again, you, you are uh, you know, a Bronx kid. You, you, you teach. You are a principal. So you're around young people all day and as uh, somebody who used to coach youth football and, and, and still tries to give back, it's, it's all about that that next generation. Mm-hmm. And we were just talking offline about sports and different things, but it's always about that next generation. Mm-hmm. Somebody might ask you, well, you know what, Jamal, you probably got a great job, good family. Um, you got, a, you know, benefits. You know, you got, you know, faculty that like, look like Eric Dickerson. Um, <laughs> why run for Congress? The simple answer is I want to have a larger impact. Mm-hmm. Uh, I want to do everything in my power uh, to meet the needs of my students and families beyond the classroom. Right. Uh, so we've had the for- good fortunes and good opportunities to do great work in the school, but we're a small school. We have about 250 students, uh, grades 6 through 8, right. and we've been able to do great work over the last 10 years. And I've been an educator for 20 years, so I right. started my career in the South Bronx, uh, taught in elementary school for five or six years, Uh, Then I moved on to become a dean of students at the High School for Arts and Technology in the MLK campus. Uh, I was there for three years. Mm -hmm. And it was at that point, after watching students go through metal detectors every day and be treated like criminals just for simply existing, I decided to brainstorm ideas of, you know, if I had the opportunity to open my own school, what would that look like? Right. So I started putting pen to paper, as I'm sure you've done with this program and many others, uh, just writing down ideas on what that school would look like. So in 2009, uh, we were fortunate enough to open up our own school, and like I said, we've done great work. However, when you look throughout the district, you see pockets of the district where poverty is higher than 20%. Right. You see pockets where the rent burdens are as high as 57%. You see uh, an asthma epidemic in, in parts of the district. You see an obesity epidemic, people living in food deserts, et cetera, et cetera. Right. While in other parts of the district, you see incredible wealth and incredible affluence and incredible opportunity. So for me, my work in education has always been about upliftment. It's always been about empowerment. Mm -hmm. It's all about ensuring our kids have knowledge of self and knowledge of their unlimited potential to transform the world. It's funny. There's only so much you could do in the school around those issues. So now running for Congress gives us an opportunity to take it to another level. It's funny you say that because, you know, if somebody just looked at the numbers, which, you know, some people do in politics, look at the big numbers. And obviously the 16th district has more... Um, uh, uh, white, I mean, um, Caucasian, um, 48% Caucasian over 32% African American. And you would, I mean, again, depending on what pocket of that district you live in, you wouldn't assume that. Mm-hmm. You know, so again, from a bigger picture, people look at it differently. And I'm, I'm glad you brought it up because there are pockets that are, are struggling. And, you know, the only thing they have to eat is that dollar menu and, and nutrition and different things. And obviously, you putting together a school, you sort of from an educational value, mm-hmm. where they're not growing and, and they're not aspiring to go greater things. And I think that, you know, should be commended. Mike, I know you have a question. For, for people who may be listening and, or viewing, whatever the case may be, and they're wondering what are the geographic boundaries of the 16th district? Mm-hmm. Um, 
Could you just give them an idea? Yeah, and, and just to clarify, so that data is a little bit off that you just mentioned. Okay. The district overall is a majority minority district, so it's mostly people of color. Okay. It's sixty five percent people of color, thirty five percent other. The boundaries include the North Bronx, which is Co op City, Edenwall, East Chester, Wakefield, Woodlawn, yeah. Riverdale as well. It also includes Yonkers, Mount Vernon, New Rochelle, and it goes all the way up to Rye and across to Hastings. Pretty Hudson. big district. So it's a, it's a pretty large district, yeah. but it, it's like America. It's a tale of two districts. Again, yeah. incredible wealth on one side, incredible uh, poverty on the other. Uh, so I wanted to highlight the fact that not only is it, is, is it a majority minority district, but it's a district that's younger uh, than it's ever than it's been in a while. And young people have a different vision and different passions and different needs. And the current representative that's there, Elliot Engel, is not connected to the district in the way he needs to be. He's been in office for 30 years. Some might say inertia has set in where he's kind of just going through the motions. Whereas the people told us in the district they need they need change. They need someone who's going to fight for them. Someone who understands their needs, someone who's been with them. My district has been with, been in, my, my school has been in the district uh, for 10 years. Right. So the relationships with the kids are there, the relationships with the families are there. Uh, so we got a good opportunity and things are going well so far. We're talking to congressional um, um, uh, uh, candidate. candidate. Man, I'm, I'm <laughs> screwing up today. Jamal Bowman, 16th District, um, Bronx, Westchester. Uh, you, you mentioned Elliot Engel. Uh, again, somebody who's been the all the, I mean ever since I can remember has been that representative. Do you think again? And I know we talk about this on this show a lot from a standpoint of political aspect. Um, do, do people just get lazy, or just becomes a situation where it's just you know, hey, you know, he's here, and I don't I don't change anything, or do you think like just because of the world we live in, social media, and everybody's just running in different speeds that they're not really paying attention because we had the same situation we had AO Alexandro Casio Cortez one um a year and a half ago going against Joe Crowley, a, kind of a guy who had been like just kinda like, you know, the mailbox in your in your house. So from a standpoint, are people just not paying attention or is it just that, you know, you just get numb to the fact that, hey, this person's here and that's just the way it is. I think people have been overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. And I think people have been beaten down beaten down by the system. Uh, this system hasn't met the needs of poor people, black people, and immigrant people uh, since the beginning of its existence, right? So people are overwhelmed, people are beaten down, people are working multiple jobs, doing the best they can and just right. try to get by. And the system has been designed against them. The right. system has been designed to oppress them. So this candidacy and my work in education and the work of many people across the country, AOC and others, is about pushing back against that system. Right. It's about reminding ourselves that within <clears throat> this democracy, we have a voice and we have power. And once we organize and come together around our collective power, Power, we'll be unstoppable. So our power is more powerful than any profit that they're trying to make in the corporate realm. Our power is more powerful than the machine, if you will, that exists uh, within the Democratic Party and within government. It's all about coming together. So our work in education has been about bringing people together, building coalitions, and moving in the right direction. And we're doing that uh, throughout the candidacy as well, and we'll do that when we win the congressional seat. As you've gone through your district and shook hands, rubbed shoulders, talked to the people, what have you found to be need number one from them? What's what's the paramount thing that you know what, Jamal, we need? So, so for me, everything lands on poverty, and, and that's what we're hearing throughout the district. So people talk about housing and public housing has been neglected for 30 years at least as we know it's been underfunded it's been neglected and it's in deplorable uh, conditions and there's a homelessness crisis in the district as well there's an opioid epidemic and there's an overdose crisis throughout the district as well that people aren't really dealing with public education is underfunded there's there are lack of jobs there are lack of tra job training there are lack of transportation but it all lands on issues related to poverty if we deal with poverty and we deal with the economic and equality that exists, not just in the district, but throughout the country. Uh, that's how we can make transformative change. People are traumatized and, and oppressed by the poverty that they experience every day. And we need to deal with that as a core issue and center caring and well-being of people first in our political space. It's something that's never talked about, particularly by Elliot Engel, but anyone who's been in that political realm for that long, they don't think in this way and they don't talk in this way. So poverty centers it, but it all relates to uh, lack of health care related to poverty, lack of housing related to poverty, 
uh, underfunded schools, lack of early childhood uh, opportunities, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I have a question, maybe a little different uh, mm -hmm. direction, but being in a leadership role, and especially a lot of people coming to you looking for change, looking for uh, you to aid them in a better life. How do you go about making tough decisions? Because you can be torn between two, and on both decisions, somebody's going to be affected. Mm -hmm. So it's like if you're trying to help poverty, the money's got to come from somewhere. How do you make the tough decisions? Like how do you keep your composure without folding on one side from being sympathetic and just <coughs> making the right logical decision? There are enough resources in this world to meet the needs of everyone. The problem is those resources are concentrated in the hands of a few while the many continue to suffer. In terms of how we're going to pay for it, the same way we pay for war, the same way we pay for tax breaks for the wealthiest of Americans is the same way we could pay for the needs of the majority. Um, so the resources are, are there. Oftentimes, media and other outlets brainwash us to believe that you have to take from one to give to the other. That's not true. It's a scarcity mindset that I think keeps us trapped into fighting for what we really need. Mm -hmm. Again, center human rights, center equality and justice for all, center the well-being of our children and our elders and our disabled and those who need it the most. Make sure that the wealthy pay their fair share into the system so that we can meet the needs of everyone else. The resources are there. We're just not allocating them for the masses of people. We're allowing the few to continue to concentrate their power. Again, we're talking to Jamal Bowman, uh, 16th uh, district candidate for Congress. Uh, Just, I know we spoke earlier this week. Um, yeah. Yeah. You're very passionate. Justice is a Mount Vernon resident. Yes. Um, money earning Mount Vernon. Money earning Mount Vernon. Do you still say that? No. Yeah. Yeah. Still, uh, the old, the us, us. But you, st you older like, folks you, say like you 21 with a beard. Uh, I am okay. 21 with a beard. Don't but I know you had some questions. Yeah, I'm for biding Jamal, my time, and I, I want to give you the floor for this moment. Um, so Jamal, I have a few concerns. Obviously, living in Mount Vernon for over too many years at this point, I don't want to count them. Yeah. But I've been voting for almost 20 years. So I know who Engel is. I, I've known, you know, you go down party lines. My first question to you is what makes you qualify to even run for Congress? Considering the things that we're going through right now with impeachment, so forth and so on. Why do you feel you're the, the person or a qualified person to even run for this position? So there are a few answers to that question. One, I come from the community that I'm now trying to serve. You know, I, I was raised in public housing. I was raised in rent control uh, apartments. I was raised by a single mom. I had a sister on crack cocaine. I have friends who've been shot and killed who are still incarcerated for nonsense. Uh, so I come from the community I'm trying to serve, number one. Number two, I've worked very directly with the people most impacted by our bad policy over the last 20 years. As I mentioned before, I started my career as an elementary school teacher in one of the poorest zip codes uh, in the country. I went on to work in, high, in the high school again with the same demographic. And now I run a middle school in the district uh, serving uh, children and families from the district. So in terms of the nuances of the impact of bad policy on their lives, uh, that's something I have a lot of their experience working with. And lastly, I would say leadership is not just about one individual being qualified. It's about <clears throat> connecting with individuals across race, across class, across gender, and bridging the gaps and building movements of people who don't usually interact with each other. This candidacy is about building a movement. It's about building coalitions. It's about organizing to make sure everybody's involved in the political process. That's how we make transformative change. One last point. When I drive through parts of Mount Vernon, I see boarded up buildings and boarded up houses. That's unacceptable to me. We are the wealthiest country in human history, mm. yet in certain parts of the country, we have boarded up buildings. That building could be turned into a movie studio, <coughs> a recording studio, a school, an after-school program. Mm. There's so many opportunities throughout Mount Vernon and throughout the district that we're not fighting for and we're not taking advantage of, and that's a vision that I have uh, for the district, and others share that vision, which is why things are going so well. So now, you, oh, I'm sorry, can I keep going? Of they course, got, you I got, got one got, more. I got one more? You warmed them up, you warmed them up. <laughs> so Very my, well said. What's going to be your agenda? Because <laughs> I, I hear you saying poverty and, you know, equality. Is, is that you're going to be your agenda if you're elected in the office? Is that going to be your agenda when you go up on the hill? Or are you going to try to, you know, assimilate to what goes on there? Because you know what happens is we send our people up there and then they forget <clears throat> the 16th district 
you know, come back here. I, yeah, I know Engel has a house in Maryland, and I had this discussion. Yeah, I'm putting his business out there. I did my homework, too. I know you well, did. It's public. Hey, Everyone hey, should know hey, that. He, he, he does not in, live in the district. He, has, he doesn't live in the district. And I, I had a conversation with my family at home about this, and I felt a certain way because you don't ever come back to the district. You show no love to the district, yet we put you in office. We pay for you to and be there. And continually put him in office. Uh, continually for how many years? <clears throat> so it's like, what are we doing? What are we going to get? Like, I understand you have to live out there because you can't come to New York and to D.C. every day. I get that part. But are you going to be active in the community? Are you going to be like another, uh, that's just like the regular congressional people that we have up on the hill now, that once we get in, we don't remember where we came from. We just care about where we're at now. Mm-hmm. I'm hip hop. I don't assimilate. Okay. <laughs> I, I I'm raised by my mom, who instilled all the proper values into me that I needed growing up. I'm I'm I was raised by a culture that made me who I am today as a person, as an educator. I would love for you to come visit our school so you could see some of the things we've done uh, as a school. Uh, we have this saying in our school when we refer to our kids and our families. Uh, I am them and they are me. We are inseparable in this work that we do. And whether I was running for Congress or not, we would still be doing work at this level. It's always been about connecting to the people most disenfranchised and oppressed <clears throat> throughout the history of America and doing everything we can to give them what they need to empower them to be transformative. It's always been about that. We're a small middle school in the Bronx, in the North Bronx. We built a state-of-the-art recording studio in our middle school. We built a state-of-the-art computer lab in our middle school. We're about to build a healthcare facility in partnership with Montefiore Medical Center so that we could provide mental health supports on school grounds and, and families don't have to travel outside of the community to get what they need. We're doing this because we've always taken a whole child, whole family, whole community approach to education. And if we've been able to do this great work in one small school, imagine what we could do throughout the district and across the country. Yes, sir. So I'm really excited about that opportunity. I'm really excited to partner with people like you and others uh, to bring these visions to reality. We have unlimited potential. We just need someone who understands that, who's going to fight for it and work with others to bring that potential to reality. With, yeah. with, uh, go ahead, Mike. We got to go take a break. Go ahead, go ahead. You want to go to break? No, no, I, I go ahead. All right. With all the opportunity <clears throat> in politics, what made that particular seat, 16th Congressional District, what you chose to aggressively seek? And, and I say that in comparison to, I mean, there's mayor, there's governor. I mean, I'm just sitting here with you for 10 minutes. I could probably listen to you talk all day. So there's mayor, that. there's governor. <laughs> um, I hear the efficiency. I hear the fervent effectualness of what you stand behind. So what made that particular political seat what you chose to run for? The system is broken at the top. The system is corrupt and rotten to the core from the top, which is Congress. The state and the city governments uh, respond to what happens at the congressional level. Change has to start at the top. And if we're able to, in the same way AOC has done, Ilhan, Ilhan Omar, Rashida Tlaib, Ayanna Presley, and many, many others in Congress, the same way they have used that position and that bully pulpit to change the conversation around how we talk about politics and how we talk about <clears throat> what's possible if we center love, if we center humanity, if we center equality and justice for all. The same way that position gives, gives them the platform to talk about these things and then create policy around the needs of the people, that sort of movement and mission can happen in the 16th district. And it, and it can happen across the country as long as regular, everyday working people continue to decide to run for office. So what they've done is broken through a glass ceiling. Now I can pay attention to politics and listen to politics with a different ear because they're having different conversations. So I'm excited that I have the opportunity to be a part of those conversations and be a part of change at the top. Then they'll trickle down to everyone uh, in the local district. Well said. I want to take a quick break. Obviously, we want to get to know Jamal, the person. I, I was told by Lil Birdie, you're a hip-hop fan. You kind of get it out the bag a few <laughs> minutes ago. But um, we're going to talk about just some things that, you know, make Jamal the man he is. We'll take a quick break. It's 9 Feet Lounge in the morning. Come on back.
We're back on the ride, 950 Lounge. Um, still joined by part of the best team in radio and, and two phenomenal people who are, I call it, uh, Mariano Rivera's in the bullpen. Tanny and uh, Mike the moderator still joined here by Jamal Bowman. Obviously talking about things in the 16th Congressional District in New York. Um, again, the um, primaries in June. June, June 23rd. June 23rd. Yeah. Um, so obviously things are getting heated as we uh, – Turn the calendar on 2020. Um, before we get into some more political questions, I, obviously, you know, I know you are um, a native son of the Bronx, and if you wasn't for the Bronx, you, you have to be a fan of hip hop. Um, give us your top five. I ask this to a lot of people, <laughs> but uh, you know, people who come from the area, you mentioned the recording studio in the school, so you around music all day. Yeah, Casa All Star uh, mixtape is on SoundCloud right now. Oh, yeah, there you go, there you uh, go. Written, written and produced by my students, middle school students. There you go, no profanity, of course. <laughs> no profanity. Uh, <laughs> but give me your top five growing up. We're, we're, I think we're roughly in the same age bracket, you know, again, who growing up or who may you still listen to now. Yeah, uh, Rakim, Karis One, uh, Nas, Jay Z, and Tupac. Okay, you okay? So uh, not in that order, like not in okay in any particular order. Rakim would be number one. Well, Rakim, uh, really? Rakim is the Rakim most is li- the one, one most lyrical. Me, yeah. yeah, you really? Yeah, yeah. 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 With I knowledge know itself, that. there's nothing I can't solve. It's 360 degrees I revolve. It's an actual fact. It's not an act. It's improving. Indeed, as I proceed to let the crowd keep moving. This Bars. man gonna be in Congress. Bars. Bars. Like, there, no, I can see him now <laughs> arguing the case in Congress no, with the rap going on. Perfect. There's no that line. I mean, seriously though. That line right there with knowledge of self, there's nothing I can't solve. Right. Like I've literally connected that line to all my studies, like throughout graduate school, throughout getting my doctorate in education, yeah. throughout my work with students. That line has driven my philosophy of education uh, throughout my life. So that, that line with knowledge of Without self, question. there's nothing I can't solve. You also mentioned another, I share, I share Rock Him too. You mentioned Tupac. Now, for those, obviously, Tupac. We know the layers that, hey, none of us are perfect. But the Tupac I remember was, you know, the 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 kid that talked about Brenda had a baby and, you know, Dear Mama. And some of the songs that are, that show a person that has a, a conviction for life and, 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 and family. Your thoughts on Tupac as an, as an yeah. educator? Yeah, I just thought uh, Tupac embodied what being black in America was all about. Mm-hmm. All aspects of it, from the political to the wild kid in the street. Yeah. You know, Tupac embodied the layers, all, the layers of yeah. it. You know, he, he, he was an artist. You know, a lot of people don't understand. He's a trained artist, trained artist yeah. uh, which, which made him, I think, more powerful as an MC. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, the song changes. I think he captures the, the psychology <laughs> of being black in America at yeah. that time. I see no changes. Wake up in the morning and I ask myself, is life worth living? Should I blast myself? I'm tired of being poor and even worse, I'm black. My stomach hurts, so I'm looking for a purse to snatch. Cops give a damn about a Negro. Pull a trigger, kill a nigga, he's a hero. Giving crack to the kids, who the hell cares? One less hungry mouth on the welfare. Like those yeah. bars right there in any captures generation. the black in any yeah. generation yeah. Yeah. captures the black experience in America. Without now we're trying to change that, right? right. And, and hopefully by the end of our lifetimes, we don't have to have poets spitting bars like that anymore. Right. That's the goal, right? By the end of our lifetime that doesn't happen. But unfortunately, that what he captured there is still true. I and think, it's something we have to deal with. I think obviously here on a point, while yes, it's the, the, the ideal is to continue to get better. Each generation, teach one, teach one. Where Pac and others had to do that. Here's a, a person that came from that, that has a doctorate, that's making change in this community, that can run by the same block and say, hey, you know what, I'm making change. It's not what it used to be because I'm doing some different things. Now taking that next step to Congress. So I think that should be commended because that's all we ever want. Like my mother told me, I, you know, my grandma used to tell me I marched on Washington so you wouldn't have to do that. And I find myself doing things now and I, I tell my nieces and nephews that I'm doing, unfortunately, that I'm hoping you don't. So eventually that tree, that, that seed we plant has to grow. And I think, again, having conversations like this and having people like yourself 
people inspire. Not nothing wrong with having a wicked jump shot or you know being able to run through tacklers, but it's also important to show people that hey, listen, the political system works, and it works not just for people you think it does. It works for you as well. But we have to be in it. We have to be right, in. Right. We have to be involved. Yes. We have to have a seat at the table, and not just on the congressional level. Right. There are local uh, political seats yes. that people can run yes. for. There, there are meetings that people can attend and just let their voices be heard. It's about being consistently being engaged. Being involved, yes. And again, because we've been so beaten down by the system for so long, we don't have faith in it and we don't trust in it. I know because I was the same way. Yeah. But I realized that in order to in order to change it, you got to get involved. You got to have a voice. You got to play the game. It. You got to be in it, yeah. Yes, but play the game based on your own rules and your own values. Right. Don't play the game based on what they think the game is and what they force us to believe the game is. No. We have needs in our communities that need to be addressed. Right. So we need to create new <laughs> rules to the game and build a new infrastructure that meets the needs of the people in our communities and in all communities. Because yeah. it's not just you know it's not just a black community thing right. or a brown community thing. There are the majority of the people in this country are suffering, yeah. and there's there's a singular adversary, the oligar the oligarchy, uh, one tenth of one percent who are trying to control all of the resources, not just in, in this country, but across the world. So that's the adversary, right? So we have to come together as a people, all people who are struggling, working class people, to fight against that system. Again, we're talking to Jamal Bowman, running for Congress in the 16th District of New York. And again, for those in different markets, you know, um, I, I definitely recommend you research this individual because he's more than just a congressman. He's a... He's what the American dream is. Um, Tanny, you had a, a question? Yes. So bear with me a little bit for the little story. It's a Take short, short, short story. So I live in the Bronx in Co-op City. You're familiar where that is, mm -hmm. right? So I don't know. When you traveling up Dyer, it changes into Mount Vernon. Correct. Whatever road that is, and it goes straight to City Hall. That's um Fifth. Fifth, right? Well, that's fifth. So my ex girlfriend used to live in Fleetwood. My dad moved. He left me an apartment yeah. in Coles. Oh, the highest Diddy area of yeah. Mount Vernon. <laughs> <laughs> my dad lives like a couple of blocks up towards Fleetwood yeah. from City Hall. So I've walked for years from Co op City all the way to Fleetwood. It's a form of exercise. Mm -hmm. And I've seen it go from being in the Bronx, looking a certain way, then right when you turned into my, um, Mount, Mount Vernon, Vernon. Yeah. up till like probably like two blocks before city hall mm -hmm. it is completely like run down mm -hmm. it does not look like what, what the city hall area of mount vernon looks like and then it's like the houses eh, the, the average average and then all of a sudden you see a lot of abandoned buildings and abandoned houses and all of these things and then once you step across where that train track that's is the north side. you're you in go, a whole different world yeah, you went from but, the south side to the north side right but that's both mount vernon cross the track right mm -hmm. so i feel yeah. like when people look at where mount vernon and needs improvement you would normally look at more of the rundown areas so being that what level tier is it where someone can say all right uh this this side of mount vernon has more funding than this side of mount vernon so since y'all are both mount vernon why aren't y'all sharing it why isn't it like that whole area having the same thing wouldn't that be uh a way where you can invest in all of these rundown areas because I'm sure if Mount Vernon all looked the same no matter where you are mm -hmm. it would bring some sort of balance at least the visual because it's hard looking at rundown houses and all of a sudden you cross the street and your whole experience just changes yeah and now I'm gonna let you answer but I'm gonna jump in on that one <laughs> I'm gonna give you an answer I'm gonna let him answer I'm gonna give you the perfect he's gonna give you the professional answer I'm gonna give you the the Negro answer. Yeah, all right, all right Negro. <laughs> <laughs> Hold your water. Look at you, boy. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, 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 no. You go oh, ahead. No, you, no, you, no, this no. is you. The, the, all right. The, so basically, the the, I don't, don't want to hear right, it. So this, is, this is, I'll be honest with you. Mount Vernon, and this is my own opinion. I've lived in Mount Vernon since I was 12. Mount Vernon is set up in three ways. Mount Vernon, when you come into Mount Vernon, is the south side, which is your lower income side. Legit, Section 8, most houses, um, to median houses around 350,000. Once you cross over the train tracks, you're looking at houses anywhere from 350,000 upwards to uh, three quarters of a million, from 750,000. Now, once you cross to Mount Vernon High School and to that Fleetwood area, which is still Mount Vernon, which people don't understand, Mount Vernon is only four square miles, but it's one of the largest cities in all of Westchester and literally all of New York State, you have million dollar plus homes. So how Mount Vernon is set up is weird. It's not that it's anything is, they just have where people are just centered. So 
Mount Vernon just came up where they've centered all the Section 8 together. Then you go over the train tracks. Now you've got your, your somewhat doing good um, community people doing better. And then when you get to the other side, the Fleetwood and the Mount Vernon High School side, now you have your rich class. It's not about diversity or diversion of funds. It's more about how you have people sectioned together, unfortunately. That's just the, Mount Vernon is such a small dynamic that you can literally, in five minutes, go from million to section eight like that. Like San Francisco. But it's like, if you look in the Bronx, you don't see it like that, but yeah. think about something. You could have your section eight over by Eden Wall, mm. but you got Riverdale with million dollar apartments. Listen, I went to City College. So nobody knows that. I mean, City College, so I was 135. Nobody knows that demographic better than me from 116th Columbia to one, five blocks up Broadway. The economics completely change. That is, th our world is cut and divide. You, the, the old ad of the, cross the train tracks. It is. Pick a That's, city. That's exactly. Pick a city. Go yeah. to Philadelphia. Yeah. South so Philly. North Philly. So that that's that's where I wanted to jump in. So yeah. it's not just a Mount Vernon <clears throat> issue. Mm -hmm. It's everywhere. Concentrated poverty is by design. It's on purpose. There's something called redlining. So communities were redlined into areas of concentrated poverty. And this, this happened during the New Deal era, which is why we're pushing for something called the Green New Deal, which rights the wrongs of the New Deal. The New Deal provided resources to certain communities to help them you know, build a middle class lifestyle. Uh, black and brown communities were kept out of those conversations, mm -hmm. uh, which is part of something called redlining, which is why we have areas of concentrated poverty. Pretty much put those people over there, uh, starve them of resources and let them destroy themselves, which is which is what you see happening today from Chicago to yeah. Philly <clears throat> to California to the Bronx to Mount Vernon. Right. It continues to happen. So what we're fighting for is to make sure those communities that have been historically ignored receive the resources that they deserve and they should have had for 100 years, right? Mm -hmm. That's what we're fighting for. So that everyone, so you talk about equal distribution, dealing with economic inequality, et cetera, Give the resources to the people who have been ignored and then allow them to pull themselves up and do what they got to do. Because I really, that has always been, I'm not too knowledgeable about politics, mm -hmm. but what I do is I look at the world and then I see if there's any changes based off of what I see. So it's like if you have a messy, junky room and you walk into that room, how do you feel? You feel like distracted. Like I like felt when I walked in into the bad. studio today. <laughs> right. <laughs> you feel like in a bad mood, right? But then if you walk into a clean <clears throat> environment, your whole energy is different. So yeah. I feel like the fact that you have these machines that clean streets, and then once they get to a certain street, they just turn. Mm. Like, what's, what's stopping the city from being like, no, this machine is going to clean all of Mount Vernon streets. So as simply as having a clean street will change a whole person's mindset. Mm -hmm. And that would that, help that, people get out of poverty. That, that is true, but, and, and you know what, brother, since you're running for Congress, we're going to address you appropriately. Is Dr. Bowman... <laughs> Well, I'm not right. blaming anybody. No, I was no, just no. wondering if like, there's an <laughs> answer my, why. My, no, no, like no. My, my, point, my point to that is that if you look at... He, he mentioned redlining. Mm -hmm. Right. If you, if you to to put that in your in your untidy room analogy, um, a room is a room is a room, right? Mm -hmm. Twelve by twelve is twelve by twelve is twelve by twelve. What we've been suffered under is that <clears throat> where one set of twelve by twelve residents could walk out their room, <clears throat> go in the hallway, get Clorox wipes, get Fabuloso, get get paper towels, where other residents of other apartments traditionally when they walked out the apartment that cabinet was bare so i got 50 people to share one bottle of fabuloso mm -hmm. that's pretty much like a, a baseline right. that's, a, that's a that's a that's a great example so in one community you know you walk out there's a there's a there's fresh bagels and fresh bread there's yeah. a there's a uh, supermarket where you could buy organic meats and everything that you need. In another community, you walk out, you got to walk 10 blocks to get to a supermarket. And when you get to that supermarket, the resources aren't even there in the right. same way they are in another community. I want to go back to something you said. You said you don't know much about politics. So you know more about politics than you probably think you know. Like the, the questions you're asking and the things you're breaking down, you're using common sense. Mm. And politics is common sense, right? It's unfortunate that because 
we all came up in a system that's racist, that's sexist, that's classist, and it's discriminatory towards the majority of people. We we it, it forced us to think as if we're bugging out, like something's mm. wrong with us. Right. That there there are more resources and opportunities <clears throat> for all people. You sense that in your gut. You right. know that that's wrong and something needs to change. That's all you need to understand about politics. It's wrong, something needs to change, and we need to do something about it because the system has been rigged against us for too long. Without question, again, talking to Jamal Bowman. Um, oh, doctor. And having, doctor. Oh, doctor. Oh, okay. Jamal doctor. is fine. So, uh, yes. right. okay. Follow me with this rod. Okay. I am now from Rye, New York. I'm a Caucasian man. I make there. about. You already know. Yeah, you already know what's. Right. You so already I'm know doing about two hundred and twenty-five k a year. I, I wrote that playland, man. More than that. You got I, way I, I, more than making, that. You're, you're making more. about seven fifty. <laughs> I have a nice house, three or four acres, two kids. I have nice everything. I've seen Elliot Engel for the last X amount of years. Make sure my lifestyle is the way it is. Why? And, I, and I've listened to this interview right here. I've heard you talk about um, hip-hop. I've heard you talk about brown. I've heard you talk about black. I've heard you talk about poverty. These things do not affect me. Where I am in a comfortable position, my kids are set, I am set. Why do you deserve my vote? Why should I leave Elliot Engel, who has, you know, done good for me for the, the last 20 years, give or take, maybe even 30 years, mm -hmm. depending on how old I am? And I live in Rye. These things don't affect me. Why should I even think about voting for you? What, what about you is going to represent me in Congress? Because from what I've listened to, and I've listened from the start of the interview to now, you talked about poverty, you talked about you're from here, you talked about you're from there. But what makes you a representative of me? So we all occupy one planet Earth. We all occupy one planet. And... We are living within a climate catastrophe right now, right? And if we don't come together and deal with our environmental issues and our climate issues, there will be no planet for anyone, regardless of how much money you make or where you live. Right. So one of the huge components of policy that we're pushing is something called a Green New Deal. A Green New Deal not only rights the wrongs of a new deal in terms of poverty, poverty, but it helps us to come together as a human race to save this planet. People in Rye care about that. That father that you just described really cares about that issue. And I know because we've been canvassing in Rye and talking to people in Rye and environment issues are the number one thing that they talk about. Another thing that they, they care uh, more about that I think people may not understand or may not know is they don't like inequality. They don't believe that, you know, I'm wealthy and if someone else uh, is given the opportunity to become wealthy, that that means taken from me. They don't believe that. They know that the system is rigged as well. And they want the same opportunities for other children that their children have. They want that. Um, we've been led to believe, and I know I used to believe this as well, that people who lived on the other side of the tracks don't care about people on the opposite side of the tracks. That's not exactly true. The third thing I, I want to mention, and you mentioned a rye, which is, which, is inter which is interesting, there's an opioid crisis taking place in parts of rye as Tremendous, well. Tremendous, yeah. yeah. And, and, and in communities like rye across the country. So in terms of dealing with that issue, the overdose epidemic, the opioid epidemic, helping children and people to find their purpose and passion and opportunity beyond the schools. Um, that is something that's, that's I'm passionate about that I've worked on as an educator, and that's something that people in Rye care about as well. Just one last point. Our school system is designed pretty much in a, in a way where as long as you get good grades and go to a good college, your life is going to be good. Mm -hmm. And what people in places like Rye and Riverdale and others are seeing is life is more than just that. Life is more than just good grades and a great job and making a lot of money and accomplishing a lot of things. It's about purpose. It's about passion. People want to know that they're living for something. And when that's not in place and we have pharmaceutical companies pumping opioids into every community regardless of race, 
these are the issues that we need to deal with very directly. So the people in Rye have issues that are important to them. Those issues cross section because there are people dealing with overdosing in the Bronx as well, as well as Rye. So uh, there are a lot of issues that we need to address together, address together and the people in Rye, uh, those issues are important to them as well. Jamal, um, we got a few minutes left and I, I can't thank you and your campaign manager enough for coming and spending some time That's here. Great. And, um, answering some of our questions, and uh, we really appreciate it. With that few minutes left, um, we got a couple cameras here. We got a large audience um, through audio. Um, why should people vote for Jamal Bowman? Because voting for Jamal Bowman is fo voting for change. Uh, it's voting for change that we didn't believe was possible. Uh, maybe. As, as much as four years ago. Uh, but then we heard people like Bernie Sanders talking a new language in our politics. We saw victories like AOC and many others. Um, so people are beginning to pay attention and lean in and believe in something different. Uh, Jamal Bowman, is that something different? Uh, this is my first time running for office. I am not raised or cultivated within the political system or within any kind of rigged system. Uh, the majority of people in Congress, 50% of people in Congress are millionaires, and the other 50% work for millionaires. Right? So what we're trying to do is add more diversity, add new voices, add different perspectives uh, to Congress, and that's the change that we're trying to bring, and it's going great so far. But this is not just about one individual winning one election. Right. This is about building coalition. This is about building a movement, and we need everybody involved, not just to help me win or to help us win, but to help involve everyone in your community. Wherever your community is from, whatever you're going through, don't allow the system to continue to exist as it currently exists. We question. have to push back against that system, uh, and I'm proud and I'm blessed to have the opportunity to do that. I have one small question. Yes. I feel like when it comes to politicians, that's usually the spot of people who are pursuing a leadership role. Mm -hmm. So if you find someone or to speak to those who feel that they want to take on a leader position, how would one start from wanting to make a change to where you're currently at as far as running for actual space to be able to do so? Mm -hmm. For me, it, it's all about following my gut, following my intuition, and be gu being guided by my heart and where my heart directs me to. Um, the other thing is just being a relentless learner, like just learning as much as, as you can about whatever it is you're interested in. Um, read as much as you can, watch as many documentaries, as many videos, talk to as many people. And again, leadership doesn't have to look like running for Congress. It, leadership to me it's a, is about letting your voice be heard and connecting with other people and having conversations and using that to build uh, consensus around a particular issue and then moving forward in that way. So leadership looks differently depending on where you're, where you're coming from. Okay, Mike, we got one question. Dr. Bowman, we are seeing a growth in the amount of non-traditional politicians running for political office like yourself. Mm -hmm. I need you to speak to the you of that's watching you, the 10, 11, 12, 13 year olds who are a soft clay in their mind who may want to go towards politics, who want to may make a significant, uh, 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 put a hand in their community. What do you say to them? I may have to get up and use him as a prop because I, would, I wouldn't Please just do, be talking Dr. with my voice. I would be talking with my hands right. as well. Can we can we do that? Yes, yeah, we can. We got cameras here. You feel me? Guess so. Guess so. Okay. Make a great as long as you don't tackle me, that's it. I, I, Hit him. I, I, I Hit him I in the face. I very pull, pull those grays hairs out of the beard. Nah, don't touch the beard. Don't touch the beard. Don't touch the beard. You've been asking a lot of tough well, questions. If I'm talking to the younger version of me, you know, I would it would be something like this. You are phenomenal. Don't ever let anyone tell you you're not brilliant and you're not magnificent and you're not great. You have the opportunity to change this world, no matter what. You could be out here with your friends playing and doing all that, that's fine. But stay focused on what's important. Look at the world around you. Everything you see, someone created, someone built, from their imagination and from their mind, you have the same power and opportunity to do that. So while you're playing with your friends as much as you can, fine. Make sure you're reading a book a day. Make sure you read as much as you can. Make sure you talk to people, ask questions, learn as much about how this world exists as possible. 
Because 10 years from now, when you're 20 and 21, you're going to be changing the world. And it won't just be you. It'll be the 10, 20, 100 people you'll have following you, disciplined around the same things I'm telling you right now. You're going to be magnificent. Don't ever let anyone tell you different. Bars. It would be something like that. <laughs> and go shave, you 10-year-old hairy kid. <laughs> um, <laughs> again, Dr. Jamal Bowman, thank you so much. For thank you. It was a it's pleasure. been a real pleasure. Where can people reach out to you, donate? Um, yeah, uh, please go to BowmanForCongress.com. Uh, click that donate button. Give us a couple bucks. Every, every dollar helps. But even more importantly, click the volunteer button. Okay, if you're willing to come up to the to the 16th district, knock on some doors with us, that would be amazing. If you're willing to make calls on our behalf just to share who I am and share what the vision is, that would be great. Uh, leafletting, giving out flyers at a so local supermarket in the 16th. Volunteering is just as important as every dollar we raise. So, you know, please help us out, bowmanforcongress.com. And whatever we can do here at 950 Lounge, please let us know. Appreciate um, it. Obviously, Big shout out to Roger, you know, put of this course. together. Shout out to Roger Maloney. Yeah, Thank say you. his full name. He, yes. He's the one. He's the one here. Um, but then again, congratulations Thank and continuous success. Pleasure. Good success. Good luck on the campaign, Doctor Jamal Bowman. We're gonna take a quick break. We're gonna get this thing moving. Nine Fifty Lounge. Come on back. Hey, it's your boy Nine Fifty Kev for the Nine Fifty Lounge Show with LeBron James and the Radio Game, the most electrifying man in media today. And I'm one fifth of the best team in radio. So I'm joined by my brother Rodeo, the funny guy, just the classic man, the cynic, aka Mr. Roper backstage, Ed, and the lovely, super talented Steph Pearl. It's 9 Feet Lounge every day, all day on multiple networks. So tell us to listen, let us know what you think. Catch us at www.9feetlounge.com or my Instagram at 950 Kev. <laughs> 